Hey Mike, welcome to the next episode of 401 Access Denied. Uh, really looking forward to this one because it's really um, in Estonia, one of the topics that's been happening uh, recently is that as of just last weekend, uh, our emergency situation uh, you know, from the government has ended and now everyone has started returning back to somewhat actually accelerated back to normality. There was no phased approach. It was just all of a sudden slam dunk. Everyone's back to the office. Oh, that's um, interesting because right- we're doing a much more phased approach here where even it's by county. So my county is following mm-hmm. a different, because we're on a border, we're following different rules than the rest of the state um, because we're following DC's, you know, because we're closer to DC. It's an interesting, oh. so we're doing, we're doing this very phased, it's across the, the state in a very, you know, bizarre way. I think, I mean, it makes a lot of sense when you think about it, but, um, so yeah, we're taking a much more phased approach, which is interesting. So inconsistency is great. That's what we all, that's what we need. <laughs> so, <laughs> no one follows the same path. So, right. but yeah, it, it kind of raises a lot of concerns. There's a lot of things we have to think about. Um, you know, one was, you know, um, that we talked about before was as people are leaving the office and taking those devices away and they're working remotely and working from home. And we've seen a lot of, you know, increase in types of attacks has happened using taking advantage of, I think one of the biggest things that I saw uh, is around remote access. That as a lot of people were taking devices that remote access has been protected from the firewall side of things. And now those devices, as they went outside the firewall, those RDP ports were now actually internet facing. Right. And then you saw a lot of attempted brute force attacks of being able to try and gain access to those RDP sessions. Um, so there's a lot of those risks that were introduced. And now as we're you know starting to see, at least in Europe, we're seeing a lot of people now slowly returning. And there's a lot of things that organizations need to think about is the health and safety. Is that are they able to provide you know clean facilities? Are they able to you know wash them down and disinfect them overnight? Um, are they able to keep you know some of those offices which are crammed packed with call centers? Are they able to keep the space between employees? Um, are they able you know? Um, I know that in a lot of places as well, like the food uh, shared locations are not possible as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so that creates you know a lot of well you know how do you how long are the days? And I even saw in New Zealand that they are doing the phase approach where it's actually a four day working week. Where you know, where then you have the flexibility of having which days you know people are in the office and you kind of mix it around a bit. So it's interesting as as moving back. But in our kind of view, is one of the things is that as it's, those devices have been out in the open, they've been in people's homes, they've been connecting to other networks, right? And now as they're returning to the office, who knows what those devices are bringing back? <laughs> right. <laughs> so and then the other, what, I think one of the things on that is because people, um, at least from our perspective, what we're looking at is people maybe working for a week, the same people in the office for about a week, Mm -hmm. uh, and then going back and returning to home and a different crew of people coming in for about a week so that we can make sure that we don't have overcapacity. So now it's not just they're coming back and it's like a one-time scan. It's like, what are we going to do with people whose devices are, Mm -hmm. you know, are are on again, off again, on again, off again, Uh, and making sure that it's going to be secure and that those devices are, are ready to rejoin the network every time. Yeah, that's interesting. It's like it's shift work, but actually, <laughs> yeah, week by week. But it's the best way to week do so week. that we can do yeah. contact tracing, right? We want to we want to have the same group of people in for a week. We don't want to have to think about all of the like who was in that day. You know, the same days that this person mm-hmm. was in. It'll make it a lot easier. Um, which I Absolutely. think also brings up a whole bunch of privacy concerns that I think we're also going to get into in a little bit. But. Um, with regard to tracking people and stuff like that, but just from the laptop yeah. perspective or computer perspective, the um, the coming and going, I think, is going to be a challenge for mm-hmm. um, for a lot of organizations. Yeah, that's been actually the biggest topic in, in at least UK and, and Europe in the last couple of weeks is the contest the contact tracing apps and the privacy mm-hmm. issues and the decision around having centralized databases versus decentralized databases where the you know it's been calculated and done on the edge devices where you have those databases of just basically references being downloaded and then you can determine have you been in contact with any, any you know anyone who's tested positive so you know for me I, i'm a bit of a favor on the decentralized approach because it means that the longevity of that database becomes irrelevant. Mm-hmm. Um, and those centralized approaches, at least, you know, the question is, is how long will those centralized databases be retained for? And it looks like most countries will decide to keep them indefinitely. So and there's a lot of kind of controversies, but I agree that, you know, the, as you mentioned, as you're doing those phase approaches of people coming in in different shifts and different groups, that at least you can minimize 
the footprint in the office. Um, and at the same time, you know who's been when and who's been in contact with who. So it at least makes contact tracing much more predictable and much more easier. Right. Um, and one of the other things, I think, um, because people because now you can't all be in the same space, you know, your mm -hmm. desk might not be your desk anymore for, you know, during this period of time where we're, we're probably going to be doing hoteling and other things. So that's other considerations to have in mind is, you know, not just limiting access, but making sure that, you know, people are spread across the office um, and not mm -hmm. right next to each other. And so that also brings up some, some challenges. And I think some concerns about like your own personal security and privacy of stuff that, you know, now you basically don't, don't leave stuff on your desk, like or in drawers. That I think mm -hmm. it, the sort of clean desk policies all of a sudden have a an, a deeper meaning um, because <laughs> <laughs> you don't know who's going to be at your desk. I guess I can't leave that sticky with my password on there yeah. anymore. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Underneath the keyboard, yeah. <laughs> Underneath the keyboard, um, it's okay. It just says password. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But it's, there was a big uh, question raised as well. There's a lot of companies now who's now putting in, uh, you know, they, they may have had CCTV cameras or, or cameras at the front doors of offices. And some of those cameras would have been equipped with, for example, uh, you know, ther uh, thermal uh, yep. reading. And a lot of those companies are now turning them on. And now to try and determine which employees have high temperatures or not. And it brings me back. I mean, I... I've been through multiple scenarios before, mm -hmm. and I myself, I was actually, uh, you know, had H1N1. I was a, a victim of H1N1 years ago when I was returning back from Peru. But going back well before that, I was even, you know, I was in uh, Malaysia during SARS. And I remember, you know, I was in a, a bus and the bus had no air conditioning and it was like 40 degrees <laughs> Celsius outside, whatever that is. And, you know, it's over 100 in the U.S. Yeah. in Fahrenheit. And you're boiling hot, you're sweating, and, and then all of a sudden they're taking the people off the bus. And they're saying, there's a big sign saying, we're now checking your temperature to see if you have a high temperature for SARS. <laughs> of course I do. And you see that, and, and, the, and you're going, hold on, I just came in from like, you know, a bus that felt like a sauna. Right. Um, it's hot, I'm sweaty. And now, you know, I mean, like, you know, humidity was just crazy. So you're actually in, you know, higher dry heat. Right. And now they're going to take your temperature to see if you've got a high temperature. I'm just like, you know what? I do have a high temperature. That, right. I don't know how accurate this is going to be. But I got, you know, as I was thinking about that and, and, and then thinking about it, as companies are putting in temperatures, that there's a lot of things, you know, your temperature doesn't just mean that you might be, you know, um, positive for, for COVID. You might have many other things. So as companies do that, there's a big question that kind of gets raised here is that does your, you know, if you do have, test positive or that if you do have another illness um, and your company's now becoming the, your primary doctor in some sense, right. does that mean your company's become, become responsible for not just, you know, health insurance, but also become also responsible for treatments, you know, your right. health, or, what, how, how much responsible are they going to take on? Right. And then there's, um, on the plus side, at least in the States, the liability issues, mm -hmm. um, I think in most States have been sort of rooted out as it's not the company's problem if you get you know you really have to prove that it was because of like your company's policy got you know put you in a position where you got sick before mm -hmm. there's any liability issues on the company but still um i still think you know people as a company i care about the, the all of the staff so how do i make sure mm -hmm. that everyone as a whole is sort of protected but at the same time protecting the individual and their privacy their their you know their sort of individual rights and i think you know mm -hmm. in addition to just the the temperature ones, I think, you know, companies that don't have those are probably not going to run out and buy them. Maybe they will. Maybe some can. Um, yeah. uh, we sort of pri I just looked into them to curious how, how, mo how much they are. <laughs> and it seemed like it would be cheaper just to hire a guy with a gun, you know, with a thing with a thermometer than to actually like install this thing and hook it up to our door. Um, but um, we have a guest system, right, that allow, you know, mm. where guests have to sign in we might actually end up implementing a system where everybody has to use that system to sign in and sign, you know, so that we know mm -hmm. who came in that day, um, getting back yeah. to the sort of like tracking or um, we, um, the system we use also said, Hey, we're doing this beta test of like a wellness mm -hmm. check. My guess is the wellness check is going to be some questions, you know, three, four questions. Like, <laughs> have you had a fever? I don't know. But like, again, it gets into that same sort of invasive, like, mm -hmm. I don't know that I like, how much do I want my company to know? And, and this is a SaaS platform. So where's this data going and how long is it going to be retained for? Mm -hmm. um, I think it's all the same thing. So it's not, it's, it goes, I think, even beyond the, the thermal scans. It's, it's you know, any type of yeah. wellness check coming in. 
I also think there's going to be way more attendance. I know we're looking at um, having people, we have a common area, it's a kitchen. And what we're going to have is someone who's like, we're hiring a cleaner who's going to be cleaning it way more frequently than the once Mm -hmm. a day that it was getting cleaned before and wiping down surfaces. Um, And so I'm guessing that there's going to be more attendance in more places making sure the men's room doesn't get overcrowded or, you know, all these different things. So um, I think you're just generally speaking, you're going to be watched more. Um, yeah. So I think that you observed, know. observed and monitored and, and lots of metrics that relates to that. Exactly. You know, watching, exactly. You know it, it might even be, you know, one thing that I did, I did a, a TEDx talk a number of years ago. It was all about the future of work. And the whole thing was, you know, I did a lot of work in, you know, autonomous shipping projects and, and automation. And, and the whole purpose of those was to take people out of harmful jobs and, you know, locations. Mm-hmm. And allow, it wasn't about eliminating jobs. It was about changing where those jobs were located. And, for example, it meant that if you were the captain of a, of a ship, that you wouldn't be sitting on the bridge of the ship. You'd be sitting on the bridge of a simulation that could be in a like office location. It could mm-hmm. be in your home. You could be sitting with a, a a bridge simulator working from your laptop at home. And the purpose was is that you know to make people you know not being disconnected for long periods of time you know in open sea in harmful waters or being exposed to even pirates you know, mm-hmm. you know modern day pirates. And um, the whole idea is that you know in this might even be you know going to the office might even not be considered as a you know a situation where <laughs> a hostile it's more it's dangerous talk about uh, a hostile yeah. work environment. <laughs> yeah, because um, even it was about you know even talking about firefighters you know removing firefighters from you know being directly in the fire where firefighters would be controlling drones that would be them putting the fires out. Um, construction workers, you would be building buildings using, you know, automation, robotics. And this gets into, well, a lot of these positions in the front line, you know, it raises you know, even delivery mechanisms and uh, retail shops. Mm-hmm. Will you be acting, interacting with humans or will not be replaced with robotics? Right. Where you're now, you know, here even in Estonia, there's a lot of uh, zero touch shopping experience. You know, it's a bit like the Amazon. Uh, right. I think the Amazon stores, you, you just go in, you take your food, you pack it up, and you walk out. Um, but, of course, you, you're still paying for it. You know, it's, <laughs> it's like, but it becomes much more automated. So maybe there's a situation where we start seeing you know, those things in the canteens where you're no longer being served by people or there's no longer people cleaning them, that these will go through some type of automation, robotics. You know, um, I saw you know one where you know, a, a pub in Spain was, you know, pulling pints um, of beer with a robotic arm. Um, mm. That might be what we see, you know, accelerate is where my TEDx talk was more focused about, you know, people in dangerous locations and dangerous jobs and how they will be able to do those, but in a safer location. Um, similar to, the, I think it was Rio Tinto uh, doing the mining trucks where now they're sitting remotely in an office controlling trucks hundreds of miles away and ultimately, you know, not in those dangerous locations. And it might be that in you know places where you know there's high possibility that we might see a, you know a advancement in innovations more in automation and robotics where we're able to continue doing what we're doing, but those high touch points uh, right. will become less and less and reduced uh, through contactless um, and automation. Yeah, I was thinking about touchless entry um, is going to be one of those things, and. Um what we're going to do around recognition, mm-hmm. you know, so that it doesn't, you know, how are you going to, you know, there's, there's easy solutions and there's low tech solutions and then there's, mm-hmm. you know, but uh, high tech solutions and innovations always seem to be um, the ones that, you know, get the most <laughs> traction for whatever reason. And so, um, yeah, are we going to uh, suddenly see, you know, the door swipes and, and keypads replaced with like facial recognition and, yeah. and stuff like well, that, or, which or even, even RFID chips in our hands that will, you know, be waving, <laughs> um, exactly. you know, in order to get access and, you know, touch touchless payments and you know mm-hmm. that might be you know kind of you know a way forward and, and even that could be your method of you know uh, contact tracing as well you know right maybe we all get embedded with chips in the future and, and that becomes mandatory <laughs> so. yeah i mean i i feel like at this point um our phones are so much like I, i'm our phones are almost mm-hmm. to that point where that's the the thing that you use. It's what you use to pay. It's what you use to swipe and all that yep. stuff. And so, but yeah, keep. It, I imagine that um, at, at retail for contact tracing, mm-hmm. now is there some sort of obligation to retain that information in a way 
that's available for law enforcement mm-hmm. or, you know, not law enforcement, available for people who, for other purposes than just strictly the typical law enforcement reasons um, for contact yeah. tracing and stuff like that. Um, I, I agree with the mobile, the mobile side of things is definitely, you know, it's, it's our, I will say that, you know, we are humans are almost an extension of the internet already because we right. are, we're, we're sensors. We, we basically have the phone in our pocket and that phone's, you know, measuring your steps, it's measuring your movement, you know, temperature readings around you. That phone is literally, you know, is we are sensors and it's basically the sensor collection point. And then it shares it with other internet servers and APIs. Uh, but of course, the problem with the phone is, is that you can give it to someone else. You can, mm-hmm. you know, strap it to your dog in order for your dog to take, get your steps for you to show that you're healthy. Right, right, right. Um, right. And that, that becomes, you know, the challenge is that, you know, you know, how do you verify that, you know, that the phone was in that same person's pocket? And right. to, I've, I've seen a lot of cases around digital forensics getting into that craziness where don't touch the phone. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> we want to make sure that it you know, hasn't been. But um, this gets in. The, of course, that's why the chips would be more intrusive, mm-hmm. you know, because because it's you know, something that you would have to to, to move it out and, and, and back in. Um, it was a base on those. But I agree that, you know, this really gets into point as well. What, what about when people's bringing those devices back in, and, you know, mm-hmm. not just you know mobile phones, but also their laptops? is you know those devices that may have rdp exposed they might have shared drives um accessing websites installing software Mm -hmm. um, on those devices that are now you know potentially the moment that might be is that those devices might be infected and as they return into the office and people you know have uh connect them back in Mm -hmm. and it might be waiting for that moment that when that device is connected to a corporate ip address range or uh, sees other types of devices that you might be all of a sudden having some type of Trojan or malware um, or worm that's basically going to you know filter through your networks. Um, right. What do you think the organizations should be doing to reduce you know you know are they going to just like they're cleaning surfaces and measuring people? Right. Are we going to do the same with devices? Yeah, I mean, I think um, you know we for our um, uh, MDM, you know, we have. Um, the ability to do mm-hmm. a lot more than we had in the past on the endpoint, right? We can mm-hmm. do it all remotely, you know? Um, and so I think um, our plan, um, the nice thing is we can do a lot of that scanning prior to them even coming into the office. Mm-hmm. And so we can sort of know what's going on. And I'm hoping to, I think that that's going to be a trend that more, you know, you can sort of do it more um, ahead of time uh, rather than waiting mm-hmm. for the person to show up. Uh, and then having to go through some sort of scan process. Um, I think back to my days of going into skiffs and like all the, you know, like if you were trying to bring a DVD in or a CD with data on it, like you just sat there in line waiting as they like scanned it and, you know, who knows how long it's going to take. Um, there were, you know, um, but yeah, I, I'm curious to think about like what other larger organizations that maybe, you know, we already were mm-hmm. fairly like work from home friendly. We had a lot mm-hmm. of this in place. And so I haven't had to think about it from that perspective for organizations that have really gone through this transformation. And mm-hmm. now what are they going to do and how are they going to make sure that like um, things are, are secure? I can imagine if you do, I mean, for a lot of them, I ho- um, I assume a lot of them have the same sort of MDMs capabilities of mm-hmm. pushing out profiles and saying like hey you know what when they come back to the office until we've run the scan we're going to have them join a separate network like this sort of you know D, you know dmz or whatever you know guest network yeah. or whatever you want to call it um where we can perform all these scans and then they get the clean bill of health and they're allowed to join the cor- the actual corporate network um stuff yeah like that. i think i think that's a smart approach i was also thinking the same is that you know the way i would have had uh, the network segmented is you would have those guest networks you'd have the BYOD zone, right. you know, where you know the personal devices were, and then you'd have your operational network and your IT and UAT right. and dev and whatever. So having it segmented accordingly, and of course, just for this period of time, even when you're doing these phased approaches of people coming in and going back out, you might actually just have them um, being connected to that BYOD or DMZ, you know, basically zone. Right. Yeah, um, I was thinking either BYOD or guest network rather than standing up yet another. Like, do I really want to stand up yet another environment? Yeah. I might as well. Those other environments are just as hostile, you know, so I might as well. Yeah. Yep. But it also means that there's a lot of companies out there that don't have those types of protections as well. So right. they might, you know, those companies who who are late to doing digital transformation or in the sale process or have only done it, for example, for uh, certain devices. But mm-hmm. in this current situation, I've seen people actually taking desktops out, you know. <laughs> right. Yeah, not, no, I've know, definitely seen that. And then I, I'm curious, like, what recommendations would you make for people? Because I think it's pretty easy to not get the those those like 
separate networks configured properly mm-hmm. and you think that oh it's a separate network oh. but like it turns out there's ways to get from point a to point b um any recommendations yeah. you have um recommend definitely i mean one of the things is having it from a vlan perspective is really mm-hmm. having a good seg- segregation and having it properly separated um a lot of mistakes what happens is is that ends up you know uh, you'll have one machine that's configured for both Mm-hmm. And that becomes a crossover, um, and that ends up, you know, all of a sudden somebody has a VPN connection open, you know, and uh, you know they end up being the, the gateway uh, for all communication back and forward. So it's really important to make sure that you've got a properly segmented, um, you know, doing it from an access control perspective is that people have to before you just allow any IP address or you know network device to connect to it that it mm-hmm. must go through some type of authentication, some type of access control, or be previously known beforehand. Um, yeah. So making sure that you know you're not all of a sudden just saying a device all of a sudden connects into one port and that's just misconfigured, mm-hmm. um, and it's on you know the the corporate network and all of a sudden now you've got that device being a crossover. So it's always be careful as well. And even uh, situations where I remember where people were going in uh, between you know corporate network and into for example conference rooms. Mm-hmm. One of the things they would have been doing is connecting to that conference room network as well. Yeah. Why they were still connected back into the Wi-Fi network, mm-hmm. and all of a sudden now, you know, those devices are also creating a crossover as well. And the purpose that we're doing that was the guest network was not being, you know, filtered. They get access right. websites, and they get, actually sometimes it was faster. Mm-hmm. Um, so it really comes down to making sure you don't have those scenarios where devices, you know, once you connect to one, you're severed from another. And you're not creating those moments of of having a, a, a you know a networks being joined from from endpoints uh, it should be made sure that it's done at the routers at the proper mm-hmm. um, access points and you make sure that any device that's coming on is a previously known device and if it's not you throw it into the vlan until uh, it you know goes through the proper controls yeah i think for the the sort of physical network the the ports that you're plugging into i think for a lot of organizations that's going to be the hardest part because you know depending on when you made that investment, you might have a bunch of dumb switches and not really the ability to have the fine grain controls. Even if you mm-hmm. have smart switches back in the main um, area, there might, you might not be, you might have to turn off a whole set of desks or, you know, can, you don't really have the, the, that fine grain control to say this port mm-hmm. and when this machine by, you know, by some sort of authentication, we know should join the rest of the network. And I think that that's mm-hmm. probably going to be one of the bigger challenges that, um, you know, Wi-Fi and, and wireless networks are fairly easy to, to do this with, but wired networks, mm-hmm. especially the older ones. And yeah, I think yeah, back to yeah. like, I worked at a place where we had, um, we were a government contractor and we had two networks. We had the company network and then we had one mm-hmm. that was connected directly to the, um, our government, um, mm-hmm. agency that we were working with. And I can't tell you how many times people, the, the, of course, the government agency one w- wouldn't let you get out to nearly as many sites as the company mm-hmm. one. I can't tell you how many times people would just switch which port their computer was plugged into in order to, to access the, you know, the raw Internet um, and, you know, sort of similar to that conference room. Um, and so I think that's going to be one of the bigger challenges of really around the wired networks. Correct. And if, you know, if you were like, you know, some people, you know, they bring in their own basically switch and, and plug into both. <laughs> right, right. Exactly. Right. <laughs> so, so they can get the most optimum um, they possibly can. So, so I think there's a lot of things for companies definitely to think about, you know, one is for health and safety um, mm-hmm. of employees and, 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 you know, here in the study, you know, it's definitely been a, a bit of a mixed kind of where there hasn't been really a lot of direction, you know, after the emergency kind of, um, kind of ended. And, mm. you know, it's really given most people, most people, to be honest, though, in Estonia, most people, their you know, normal nature, as I mentioned before, is they're social distancing all the time anyway, even right. when they're in the restaurants and parks and, 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 and in general, um, was it communities. Um, so, again, at least people are, are more aware and more cautious around it. Uh, but definitely it's seen a, a, as a kind of a complete opposite to what it was just a few weeks ago. Mm-hmm. So hopefully, you know, really organizations are really thinking about, well, for those who are maybe in high risk, uh, you know, that they can continue working from home and working remotely, um, you know, making the offices as safety and as, you know, health focused as possible, but also taking in the considerations of privacy and people's, you know, opt in approach and not, you right. know, of course, we still have to think about, you know, what you mentioned earlier in EU would still be a GDPR uh, yeah. scenario. And GDPR, you know, still applies, you know, there's exceptions in a emergency situation where the government can do exceptions. But now since those emergencies are ending, 
Mm-hmm. Um, and the GDPR kind of applies back again. So it really comes into really being considered around privacy and around opting in and consent of employees as well. So I think, you know, comfort, health and safety, and also from a security perspective is, is that, you know, security is also something we should also be considering, you know, uh, minimizing as possible. And, and it might be, you know, for this temporary period that, you know, if you have an existing guest or, or, or BYOD network set up, probably a good idea to use that for the meantime right. until you, you do have an MDM solution that you can scan those devices. Um, you can patch those devices before bringing them into the network. Yeah, no, that's a great idea is just to sort of continue using what you may already have in place. And I think the other part of it is to recognize the flexibility. Like we have a lot of people who Mm -hmm. um, they have children and so their schedules might not be the same schedule that, you know, would normally occur. And so um, Mm -hmm. with kids not going back to school. So um, also designing for that flexibility and the recognition that it's mm-hmm. not, you know, that the people are still going to be coming and going and, and it might be day in, day out. It might be a week at a time. Who knows? And so having that in mind when you're planning it out, that it's not just a one time. OK, everybody's back. We're good yeah, it's, yeah. And it come back quickly. Yeah, so <laughs> yeah. It's definitely not going to be, you know, I, I completely agree. And, and here in Estonia as well is that schools, while there's still probably another couple of weeks left, um, they are not going back. Uh, they're still doing remote, uh, you know, uh, online schooling. Yeah, distance and, learning. Yeah. yeah, which means that, um, yeah, parents will have, the, and you're not going to have babysitters. You're not going to have places to put them. So you're basically going to have to to do that or balance it between families. So absolutely, as organizations will have to be flexible and they have to be aware of, um, you know, definitely parents in those situations. So, you know, we, we had to be a lot more conscious and, and flexible and, you know, make sure that people are able to focus, um, you know, because the last thing we want to be putting is right now in the situation is, you know, mental health becomes a major challenge as well. Definitely. And, you know, this is, you know, can put a lot of stress on people and we want to minimize that where possible. So we do have to make sure that we support the employees to mm-hmm. make sure that their health and safety and comfort is their utmost priority. And uh, absolutely, as you said, you know, you know, might be that some people will have to to continue, you know, uh, working remotely for the foreseeable future. Right. And I'd also um, sort of add that, you know, testing it ahead of time, making sure that it is as Mm -hmm. ready as possible before people are coming back, because you don't want to add more to that stress. You want it to be okay, we know what we're doing. It's not like every day I come in and there's some new policy or what we did yesterday is different. Like we want it to be mm-hmm. as smooth as possible and as tested as possible. And, and granted, you know, there's always going to be gotchas. It's tough as an ad. I know as an ad, like when I have admin rights, it's tough to test every single thing as a normal user. Mm-hmm. But if you're doing proper, you know, segregation of privileges and the other things, um, you should be able to do all that testing. But, you know, there's sometimes there's there's some challenges there. But um, definitely want it to just be as smooth as possible. I completely agree. Testing. Yep. That's, that's the key thing is, is testing. Yep. <laughs> don't, don't just <laughs> run into, into things without really considering, you know, the implications and having good measurements and good, uh, testing in place. So that, that's fantastic. I think this gives our audience a number of things to be thinking about as they're probably, you know, facing this in the coming weeks. Um, you know, mm-hmm. different countries and different people around the world will probably be having different periods of time where this will be, you know, starting to occur. And, you know, there might be, you know, continuous changes coming. So um, hopefully this will be a good message, a good things for organizations and people and, you know, IT managers and to really consider, you know, around what things that uh, they need to be considering as you know, over time, employees will start returning to the office. So, Mike, pleasure as always. It's great to have you on the show. And uh, really excited that uh, hopefully this will give uh, the listeners uh, something to think about and uh, some ideas that uh, maybe they can even share on social, you know, contact us and say, you know, share with us if you've got things that you think about that are important uh, uh, as people are returning to the office. So thank you. Awesome. Yep. Thank you. Always a pleasure.